So good afternoon and welcome to episode seven of our space talks. Tonight we will talk about public space, ideas of public space. And uh, we have two very inspiring guests for this. We have uh, Marina Sanahuja from the architecture and planning co cooperative Voltes from Barcelona and Nikos Anastasopoulos from the Technical University in Athens. Welcome and thanks for being with us. My name is uh, Stefan Pollack. I'm a, a member of uh, AKP0, one of the four organizations that are actually um, promoting this series of debates. The others are uh, Piliko from Greece, Rahovica from Bulgaria, and Vaha also from Italy. Well, um, public space. As you know, um, the discussions we are having in, uh, in our space talks uh, are inspired by our experience uh, with uh, lockdowns and with uh, uh, the epidemic, epidemic that we experienced in the last weeks. This was a bit the starting point. And from there, we said, let's talk about this. What, what did this actually change for our way to see our role of architects or as citizens, both probably? And uh, is there something that we can learn from it? So this was a, a, a little bit the, the input. And yeah, together with our guests, we would like to understand a little bit more about this. And I would perhaps start really with a quite personal question. So of course, I start with the lady. Marina, how was your experience in, in these three months, let's say? Is there any special place that you missed particularly or some experience? Is there something like that? Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Stefan, for the introduction and also for the invitation to all the groups that organized. Uh, so um, my, my personal experience uh, uh, that I wish, would like to share with you is like uh, the experience that, that most, many people in Barcelona could have uh, lived also. Uh, is that experience of uh, leaving the lockdown from the neighborhood? Okay. Um, what what I was uh, observing from like like not very formal obser observation, just uh, like me as a neighborhood, as a, um, um, okay, somebody somebody who was leaving this lockdown from the house. Uh, I. Uh, Quite enjoy this this lockdown. Okay, first of all, but also um, I would like to share how the, um, the dimension, the social dimension of space, was super present during lockdown, at least in my neighborhood, and I I think also in other neighborhoods of Barcelona. I think it's uh, related to um, a notion of identity related to neighborhood that existed previously uh, previous the lockdown, that I think in this city is particularly particularly strong. And it has to do with um, the um, social organization that uh, emerges from the neighborhood in order to fight for uh, whatever, for many of the fights uh, during the last 40 years has, has been precisely uh, related to public space or public transport or gentrification or urban, urban stuff. So uh, 
it has generated that uh, a kind of community between people that maybe you don't know each other uh, deeply, but you know more or less the people that you see in the street in a normal situation. That so also uh, many people are organized. So um, this generates also so um, a bit of um, uh, strong links between the people and the organization. So when uh, the lockdown arrived, the first thing that uh, happened in many neighborhoods was uh, uh, they started to generate a net of self-support. Uh, su uh, and these uh, nets were organized uh, by neighborhoods. So finally, what happened is that I was much more connected to my neighborhoods the, in the four or five streets around me. Uh, and we were related. Maybe we didn't know each other uh, deeply, but we knew uh, where they lived. And these nets could um, they serve as a um, ways to provide uh, yeah, to provide old people uh, with the shopping, or maybe uh, call somebody who was feeling alone, or uh, go to take care of the kids of somebody. Also to to prevent uh, violence in the houses. So. It was really nice how the dimension of the neighborhood and also the location of the people in the map was really important to organize this net of uh, help, of uh, mutual support. And the map uh, was the most important thing because uh, the organization was related to where you were, where you were lo located in the map. So I think that the previous community that was uh, generated during many years uh, in and the identity that that has been um, associated with the neighborhood for decades. Uh, when the lockdown arrived, it was super useful to uh, feel less iso uh, isolation in the houses and um, help each other. So I think it was nice the dimension of the space in this okay. time. So what you're actually saying is that my question was uh, not well posed because uh, I, I was talking about what, what you missed, but actually you, you gained something. Uh, yeah. that's, that's the impression I have from your answer, yeah. which is, of course, I mean, good. <laughs> I, I will, I will tell, talk later about what I missed. I have time. No, no, don't worry. It's uh, <laughs> just to... <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you, the, about what you're saying. And, uh, and I, I will immediately pass the, the word to... Nikos, because I would like to know if he has similar experiences uh, from Greece or from Athens specifically. Uh, Nikos, I know that you are concerned with uh, public space also in terms of research. Uh, it is a research issue for you, isn't it? So uh, I, I had this curiosity. Is there something that you had ongoing that you had to interrupt uh, for the lockdown or, uh, or not? And the second question is, of course, what is your experience uh, with what Marina was explaining from Barcelona? Right. Um, hi, Stefan, and hi, everyone. Um, I will um, start by telling you a personal story uh, which uh, relates precisely with this uh, period of time that uh, coincides with the lockdown. I was actually um working on a paper that has to do with um common space common urban space actually it's for an upcoming book um and um three days after the lockdown here in athens uh i was uh, supposed to um finish and uh send a, a final draft of my paper on uh, the urban commons. And um, it was a really hard day. I was sitting in front of my laptop for many hours and uh, I have a habit which uh, turned out to be really uh, a very bad one. And uh, this is a warning to everyone. I was sitting on my left foot and when I stood up after a very long time at this uh, particular pose, uh, my foot was numb. And as a result, I fell and I tripled over and I had a fracture, a metatarsal fracture on my left foot. <laughs> so um, I was actually homebound uh, for two reasons. The one was a uh, totally personal and had to do, it was an, totally ironic because I was working on urban commons and I 
as a result, found myself being homebound. Um, now, during this period of time, uh, all courses uh, that uh, are being taught at the university were transferred to uh, the virtual space. And uh, so I was teaching two courses uh, virtually. And uh, another interesting thing that uh, occurred, actually two, the one is that um, with uh, a group of friends that we regularly um, uh, exchange uh, in physical space, uh, there was an idea that came up that uh, we should um, meet virtually. And um, so we managed to actually... Um, pull together in this discussion about eight people from um, both Athens, but also from other places like the island of Sifnos or London or a northern city in Greece, uh, which is Drama. And this became our favorite Saturday evening uh, yes. event, which continued uninterrupted throughout um, the lockdown. Uh, the other thing, the second thing I would like to share with you about this uh, experience of uh, this period of time was that um, not only because I was um, homebound because of my um, fracture, but because uh, everybody else was also homebound. It was like, uh, you know, inadvertently they were uh, supporting me by doing the same thing. Um, <laughs> People found um, as um, a way uh, out, let's say, to air themselves, um, to uh, go to the rooftops of um, the Athenian buildings. And this became, yeah, this is a, a photo that um, is uh, the view that I see from uh, my veranda. So... Uh, Every evening I would go up, uh, I would drag myself together with uh, the boot uh, that uh, I was wearing um, to the rooftop, but uh, so was uh, everybody else doing. So there was a community of people that gradually uh, formed, uh, that we knew each other, we knew their habits, we knew when they would go up, uh, at which time. Uh, and it was as if a uh, public space uh, moved from uh, the ground level to the rooftop level. It was it was a really interesting thing. Um, so one thing I would like to share for now, and of course uh, the discussion will continue around this, is that um, I have mixed feelings about this period of time. I have. Uh, of course, uh, the feelings of um, um, of being um, cut out somehow uh, from uh, my regular habits, but uh, I also have the feeling of um, um, discovery of uh, different means of communication and um, of um, of um, let's say coming up with uh, different means of uh, creating public space at uh, places which were not uh, thought before. Rooftops uh, of buildings in Athens were mm. hardly ever visited, so this is quite unusual. That's very interesting, Nikos. I think we will come back to, the, to that point. Uh, for the moment, I would like to introduce uh, another perspective, uh, a slightly different one. Um, because I would like to watch a, a, a short video excerpt together with you from a documentary called New City Map. It was produced by Giorgia Dal Bianco, a planner uh, from uh, Rome. And, um, well, um, it introduces a point of view uh, from a category that we are considering less normally, and we can see how uh, these people are using the public space. But let, let's look at the video so and then we can comment it later. Di un nuovo modo di pensare la città, più accogliente, più integrato e più vivibile per tutti. 
Lo spazio pubblico oggi ha il problema di eh, dover in qualche modo quindi ricoprire uno status di accoglienza, di dover rispondere a un'esigenza che eh, c'è, che c'è nella città di Roma, che c'è nelle altre città italiane e diventa per qualcuno quindi uno spazio privato è il loro spazio privato e quindi cambia completamente la funzione che ha avuto in origine. Quella di costruire un oggetto che andasse in strada offrendo innanzitutto un servizio eh, importante per i migranti che è quello eh, dell'energia elettrica e delle, eh, di, del wifi. Questo carretto, lo chiamiamo carretto, ma è una struttura che poteva in qualche modo essere in transito un po' come loro, che poteva girare per la città di Roma, che poteva transitare per la città di Roma e avvicinarsi agli spazi pubblici utilizzati. La struttura è realizzata con dei pannelli apribili che possono essere anche smontati e possono eh, comporsi in infinite combinazioni, formare eh, degli ambienti chiusi oppure un cineforum o una tavolata, si possono smontare i pannelli e creare una tavolata per, per pranzare. siamo riusciti attraverso appunto le interviste a far uscire quelli che sono uh, i luoghi in cui il migrante si muove a Roma e, e quali sono i servizi di cui ha bisogno. Sleep. You know, no. Where do you sleep in Roma? The second house. The second house. Okay. E questo ci ha permesso di arrivare ad, a una, ad una mappatura, cioè mappatura di eh, associazioni o di luoghi o di spazi pubblici eh, dove il migrante in transito si muove all'interno di Roma. So before commenting the video, uh, thanks again to Giorgia Dal Bianco, the main author of it, that she made it available for us uh, to see this quick excerpt. 
And uh, another thing that I forgot to say before, um, if there are questions from the audience, you can write in the YouTube chat directly and we will try to integrate your curiosities in our talk as far as possible. Okay, so on the video I have uh, three little considerations to, to make and let's see if you agree. <laughs> One is that uh, our cities are not intrinsically hospitable for, uh, for weak categories. It's something we probably do not consider enough. And, but sometimes also uh, the solutions are uh, just around the corner. They can be very simple, very ephemeral and temporary, like those plugs provided with uh, small photovoltaic panels and uh, people could charge their phone and call home, which, which is a primary need of migrants in transit. And actually at the same time, what emerges also from these uh, images is that uh, these categories that we are uh, brought to see as weak are actually pioneers. They are somehow uh, helping us in discovering the space in a completely other way. On this, I, I would like to ask Marina, because I, I, I think, I don't know, first of all, if you agree with this, um, with this interpretation of, uh, of counter heroes at, as, uh, mm -hmm. This is something Giancarlo De Carlo once said in one of his papers. He said, uh, urbanism needs counter heroes. And because he, he discussed quite a lot about this power, about top down and bottom up and what is participation. And so having stakeholders or stakeholder categories that bring a completely disruptive perspective is perhaps uh, somehow needed. What would, you, what would you say? And are there other categories? I, I know that you work uh, a lot with children, for example, but perhaps there mm -hmm. are others also. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm. I like this 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 question, and I agree with your with your suggestions, of course. And but I would like to go further because uh, yeah, we work a lot with children, as you said, like the paper of the view of the children in the in the city, uh, and also we we work in, with participation processes. So also we have uh, been um, near uh, working with uh, groups that have developed uh, what they call uh, feminism, feminist urbanism. And that uh, what, what I like to make a, a summary, some, some, some lines, but uh, what tries to, to bring this perspective into urbanism is to question the, um, the ideology, the, uh, ideology behind the design of the urban space okay and what the uh, first uh, show is uh, like the most of the designers that um, participate in the design of the city uh, are um, are part of a small part of the of, uh, of groups of social groups that is a uh, people in a certain age, like adult age, in most cases they are men uh, and they uh, belong to a Mm, narrow um, economic and cultural class that uh, doesn't um, normally is a middle or high class. So what this uh, perspective, uh, looking at the city, says is that uh, in with this uh, point of view, many times we are losing uh, many other points of views and we are forgetting uh, the diversity of different uh, profiles that use the city. Of course, the, the profiles that normally are excluded from this uh, part, uh, point of view that uh, interact in the participation of the city are the ones who have less power. So finally, urbanism, uh, if we touch with uh, urbanism and politics, uh, they are completely linked. So what this uh, perspective of feminist urbanism uh, brings uh, to the debate, I think it's that um, they try to, in, to look for methodologies uh, which uh, introduced introduct, um, different points of views, uh, different city maps into, the, into one's uh, only city. No? So in this sense, I think this, um, uh, the, the purpose of the, of the video or of the device they invented is in is a it's really um, in the same line as the, these methodologies that these groups are creating. They are trying to map uh, the different situations um, 
that the people live uh, according to their um, category, social category. For example, they have a show how uh, through interviews and workshops uh, developed with uh, women of different uh, uh, countries, uh, different ages. Uh, male, woman, whatever, different uh, social categories, they have discovered how the city is lived so differently uh, depending on your social category. You know? um, so in the sense, they try to make these maps in order to, to generate tools to the government or to the designers or to the people themselves in order to um, design or um, encourage to participate in the design of the city and uh, yeah, sharing the point of view, the point of views, and how they use a city in different ways. So, in this sense, uh, I like to also to to talk about um, a particular element to to put an example of how this um, point of view is uh, working. Is for example the white of the sidewalks that uh, recently we have uh, been hearing that uh, it's not enough. Uh, like in many cities, the um, Sidewalks are really narrow to to guarantee this uh, social distance that we need now, and it's funny, you know, not funny, but uh, for example, these groups uh, that had created these um, different maps had uh, said during many years that uh, the site and uh, the size of the sidewalks had been a problem for many users of the cities for a long time. Uh, for example, they say that not um, okay. Feminist uh, urbanism is not just to to collect the point of view of the women who live in the city, but the diversity. Okay, so they um, they try to focus also on uh, older people or young people who live the city differently. And in this sense, uh, coming back to the the dimension of the sidewalks. They have a, there's a long time that they um, claim that the street should be more wi uh, wider, uh, the car should uh, have less space because uh, there are people who need more than one meter to walk along the street because they carry uh, children in their bags, they are uh, carrying the shopping or they need uh, some older people need somebody next to them to help them walking. So these are categories that without uh, maybe the, without uh, spaces where they can uh, give their opinion or share the, how they live the city, m many times they are uh, completely um, out of the discussion. No? And, and it's funny that now the, we are uh, claiming for wider uh, sidewalks and in other, uh, in other groups they have been many ages reclaiming, reclaiming this. I see two very interesting aspects in what you're saying. Uh, one is, again, the issue of weak categories, uh, categories that makes uh, that brings me a bit the idea of um, we have a uh, book author here in Italy, Francesco Tonucci, who wrote this book, uh, mm -hmm. La Città dei Bambini. I don't know if you know it. Um, yeah. That's, I'm not saying this uh, to bring the discussion back to children. It's not the, <laughs> it's not the point. But uh, he, he, there's a very interesting statement that he just says. Uh, a, uh, a city that is uh, built uh, correctly for the for the weakest is a good city for everyone. So mm -hmm. uh, changing the point of view from this in this sense uh, helps probably in designing uh, mm -hmm. city space. And on this, I would like to uh, ask uh, something uh, to Nikos because I I have a, a bit the impression that um, it's very much a matter of of access. Uh, I mean, we have many cities where with beautiful recreational spaces, sometimes because a piece of nature have, has been saved and transformed and redesigned, sometimes because we have uh, archaeological presence as uh, very much in your city, I, I suppose, uh, which is amazing to, to visit, but uh, it's not uh, just next, uh, next door. <laughs> so it's not uh, available to everybody. So um, this is a bit, um, on the other hand, what we have very often uh, are the everyday spaces like sidewalks, what Marina was uh, mentioning, uh, or um, yeah, mainly the, the really parks, also parking lots, like we saw it in the videos, the everyday spaces that are not uh, needed designed uh, and sometimes uh, not even maintained. Uh, so this makes it perhaps difficult to talk about uh, uh, an equity of public space in a certain sense. And the question is, 
how far from home should public space be? Right, that's uh, an interesting question, the way you put it, uh, Stefan. Uh, I should start perhaps by saying that uh, some of the um, uh, uh, comments I would like to make about our present state of things, and um, I'm referring, I guess, at a universal scale, uh, is um, a state of transition between um, a let's say relatively um, uh, traditional way of using public space and uh, the notion of public space and um, a new and emerging uh, use of the public space or understanding of the public space, which has to do with uh, developments that have occurred before the coronavirus. And um, I'm referring to uh, technology and the way that this uh, affects our um, social uh, needs for interaction. And um, in a strange way, just as your video uh, showed, demonstrated, uh, there is a level, perhaps, of uh, equity between um, uh, people that are uh, dispossessed and uh, in need, like um, uh, the refugees or the immigrants, and um, people that are um, the residents, have been the residents of uh, uh, a particular place and a particular city for a long time. They all of them use a uh, smartphone uh, at the moment in order to communicate. And um, I noticed that uh, you may have people um, sitting next to each other and um, communicating over social media uh, through uh, their mobile phones rather than talking to the person that is next to them. Um, similarly, um, people that uh, have traveled from uh, uh, faraway places and ended up uh, being in Rome or in Athens or in other big cities as uh, refugees uh, connect to their uh, loved ones, the people that they have left behind uh, through mobile devices. And as you said, it, we can see this as a pioneer use of public space. It, it's one way to put it, I would, I would rather say, because what happens is that um, you experience a um, minimal public, uh, I'm sorry, a minimal private space around uh, a person attached to a mobile that creates a connection to uh, another private uh, space and um, a personal uh, contact that may be anywhere. And this is um, a way to satisfy our need to be able to be connect, to stay connected to uh, the people we love. But it's not necessarily something that um, is beneficial to the notion of the public space, um, at least the way we know it. Um, and in that respect, I feel that, uh, generally speaking, and uh, more specifically, if I would like to um, land it to the city of Athens, I would say that um, uh, public space is um, a resource in scarcity or any, a resource in transition, uh, with whatever that means. Uh, for um, two years, uh, one of the courses that I taught uh, was in um, a public, uh, in a neighborhood which is called Victoria Square in Athens, in uh, which in 2015, uh, when uh, the city experienced a huge influx of uh, immigrants, it was um, used as a... Um, 
camping ground for uh, immigrants. So the course that I taught was um, um, uh, was having the form of an urban lab. So it was taking place within the neighborhood um, and uh, it was taking into consideration the way that uh, the public space of uh, the square, Victoria Square, was um, being used. Um, and um, one thing that came out out of this um, um, course was um, the design that was collectively produced by the students and it was actually a cart that was meant <laughs> to be used um, around food it was a play it was um, a tool that could uh, be um, moved uh, with uh, wheels uh, by hand and it had um, um, provision for spaces that could be used for um, uh, food that could be either cooked on the spot or be brought from somewhere and shared with others because we figured, actually the students did, and uh, I um, encouraged them to continue on this, that uh, food is one of the elements that make social space universal for everyone, regardless of um, the transition stages that we are in that uh, I described earlier. This is very uh, interesting. Generally Sorry. speaking, uh, just one more thing. I just yeah. wanted to say that um, um, I think that there are many contradictions that we are experiencing as uh, uh, societies and um, as uh, a species, I would say, the human species, species, because we are, we ourselves are actually um, moving into uh, different stages of existence um, that we are not, uh, for sure, we are not um, able to predict what, um, you know, humanity will be like in um, not, of course, not in uh, centuries from now, but uh, not even in uh, a few years or decades from now. I mean, um, the prosthetic devices that um, we are, we have to our disposal every day, like the ones we are using now to communicate, are evidence of the fact that uh, we are um, changing um, and our needs are being adjusted to different modes of um, of activity. Let's yeah. say. Yeah, that's that's interesting because the, there is of course somehow a, a tendency, a, an an evolution, and if you say that this evolution is not predictable, I totally agree because it's a it's a non-linear process. With uh, it has bifurcations at a certain point, it has to take one way rather than another, and so that makes it difficult to predict. There is one aspect I want to come back a little bit on our public spaces related to coronavirus and uh, lockdowns because. We entered now somehow uh, a second phase where we, where we can say that activities came back to, to the cities, but at a, at a different pace. For example, in Rome, where I am, uh, we still have very much um, the sensation that uh, tourists did not come back to the city, and which is strange on one, one way, which is also for some aspects beautiful for uh, us who live there, because we can visit places that are normally overcrowded. <laughs> But um, yeah, but then the other aspect that I wanted to introduce is the fact that uh, a discussion we have here, and I know that uh, it's the same discussion in other cities as well, is uh, that in order to enhance the physical distance, which is needed now um, for sanitary reasons, uh, public space uh, is granted to private enterprises, so restaurants, cafes, and so on, can enlarge their spaces into the public realm 
in order to grant physical uh, distancing. That's a bit uh, the game which is played now. And I see exactly I see this exactly as one of these bifurcations. This can be an opportunity to enhance things that we always dreamt somehow, because it's not wrong to say secondary streets are close to vehicular traffic and are finally eventually made uh, available for uh, for pedonal areas. But at the same time, uh, it's public space becoming private space. Um, it's somehow a loss of collective control. So is this something you would be afraid of, uh, Nikos? Um, I think that you raised some interesting topics that I would like to take the advantage to follow up on. Um, in one of our conversations with uh, the group that I mentioned earlier, that we had regular discussions on Saturday, uh, every Saturday during the lockdown, was the need to find ways to move away from uh, an eternal growth uh, process and uh, embrace uh, possibilities, the possibilities of a degrowth, let's say. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine that uh, you are familiar with um, the term and the theory. And uh, uh, of course, nothing of this is easy, but um, the, this particular period of time was like, let's say a test drive. It was something that allowed us to experience uh, some of the aspects of uh, slowing down. A forced degrowth somehow. Yes, perhaps a forced degrowth, but that some of us might um, uh, be willing to embrace as a, as a voluntary degrowth after mm -hmm. that. We have a question from the audience, which is very much related to this. Uh, somebody's asking about the the lower economic activity and how this relates to the public spaces. Is this something that affects, because we, we had this slowdown, uh, a lot of activities were actually closed, others had to slow down. And uh, so as a, as a result, we had uh, void spaces for uh, long weeks. Uh, but does this affect also somehow the, the public space uh, in the future? Um, perhaps, uh, Nikos, if you want quickly answer to that, and then we pass the word to Marina. Uh. Yes, uh, it's a very good question, actually, because uh, much of um, many of the symptoms that we are experiencing in um, the deterioration, a state of emergency in uh, uh, the environmental uh, aspects uh, all around the globe have to do with a particular form of economy which needs to be addressed. It's an exploitative economy, both in terms of uh, natural resources and as well as um, in terms of um, uh, social capital. In other words, it, it's an economy that exploits um, the so-called uh, Global South still continues to do that uh, to the advantage of uh, the few uh, societies that belong to the Global North or even less so to the very few that have um, collected uh, an incredible amount of wealth um, to the detriment of um, societies everywhere. So it's definitely uh, at the root of the uh, issues that we are addressing, an economy that needs to be um, reimagined in okay. order to be able to serve people better as well as the planet. Okay. I would like to know a little bit more about Barcelona. So, uh, <laughs> Marina. Seen from outside, uh, if, if we talk about Barcelona and public space uh, seen from our perspective, uh, it's always uh, um, seen as a, a, a pioneer uh, situation. So we, we have always this idea that uh, you are very, very ahead on, on this discussion. 
starting perhaps already with the uh, with the Serda plan, which is certainly uh, a very strict structure and a very, uh, if you want, uh, um, controlling structure. But then it has this marvelous uh, 45 degree cuts, which is actually something where <laughs> where urban planning managed to take away um, volume from uh, the speculation and say, no, we also need public space in er in each. Uh, crossing, so the, uh, perhaps there's something already in the in the DNA of uh, of public spaces in, in Barcelona. Because I I know that then you have other experiences. I I, I think about the the Super Ia uh, experience mm -hmm. uh, more recently, where you uh, re um, reorganize uh, spaces designed for vehicular traffic in order to host other activities. And um, and all these processes, as far as I know, are uh, of very often uh, achieved with uh, interesting uh, participative processes. I also know that you at Voltes are involved in some of them. So I don't know if this is something that where you could add a few words on. Um. So I think that the relation, the direct, the, the direct re relation of Barcelona with um, urban planning is uh, is very strong and has uh, many different uh, quality chapters. Mm -hmm. um, for example, it's true that Serra Plan it, it changed the city completely and gave this um, this uh, significance of the city in in terms of uh, urban planning. Uh, and it's nice to to remember that the, this plan was uh, originally thought in order, um, according to hygienist uh, premises, uh, it was a plan uh, thought to um, to avoid the density of the previous city that existed, is the, the, the medieval medieval city. Uh, but finally, what happened with the Serda plan? Uh, at the beginning, it was thought um, with a double or three, uh, or three times more the public space that you can find today. I mean, all the inside parts of the blocks were empty in order to give this space to the public. But finally, just because the uh, speculation, speculative logics, uh, finally it uh, ended up to, they ended up to construct, build in all the perimeter of the blocks. So the original hygienist and um, public um, principles that there were behind the, the urban plan, finally, I think uh, they um, stopped in the, in the middle. No, they didn't reach all the all the aims that Serta had with the with that plan. So okay, it's true that the, there is a lot of space for the public, but if you look at the um, at this area, the Chample that we are talking about, this area of uh, designed by Serta. Uh, finally, the presence of the car, uh, unfortunately, is uh, much more important than the one of the pedestrian, the one of the of the of the people. So, in this sense, I think um, there have been many different, um, yeah, like ex experimental no? experiences that uh, the city government has tried to to um, go go back to the principles of uh, Serda in order to give more public space in this area of the Eixample. And um, one is the Superillas, as you told, that is, I think it's working quite, I mean, it's, uh, sometimes it's difficult when the plans come from from up, no? because uh, sometimes they come from great ideas that the city government has in that time, but um, uh, it's difficult to combine the rhythm of the plan and the rhythm of the people getting used to this new uh, uh, space that, the, that it, it has been created. No? And also the participation that has tried to link these uh, new urban plans to the uses or the, and the affect uh, of the people. Um, sometimes I are a bit too much bureaucratic and it's difficult that we get uh, results, like immediate results. I think that uh, apart from participation, we need to, the time in order to see if uh, these uh, operations are, are successful uh, or not. No, the, the, and I, with time, I mean maybe uh, a decade or, or more, no, to see how these uh, ideas finally work. Really and yes. in this sense. And in this sense, in these last weeks, uh, the city government also has uh, tried a new um, operation, a new, yeah, it's true that Barcelona is normally in, in, the, in the 
uh, avant-garde of this uh, experience, but uh, has decided to block some streets and destinate completely to pedestrians or bikes. And um, because the the ideology of uh, this uh, government uh, has uh, has been also uh, in recent years has been trying to uh, promote the use of bicycles and trying to reduce the presence of the car. But uh, it is very difficult to change uh, from one day to another. But with with this uh, experience of the lockdown, in, in truly like the city now is a white paper, um, almost a white paper, where it's easier to experiment. Of course, there is a big um, deal now between private drivers and uh, also the on the transport companies that have to to travel uh, around the city with a car because they have decided to block some streets and okay the, uh, the streets are for pedestrians you cannot go inside with a car and they have decided to um, to paint with uh, yellow colors all these spaces in order to make them really visible so okay it's it's conflictive because of course uh, from one day to another it's uh, difficult to to make people um, getting used to a new idea of the city but um, let's see what, what will happen with this new experience. I don't want to make uh, my, my opinion uh, yet because I think it's too early. But yeah, I think now they have tried with this now strategy. Uh, I think the previous strategies in the city of Barcelona were much more bigger. And with the time, I think they have tried to, to, to reduce the scale of the urban interventions at the beginning. Uh, I don't know, since I have memory, I have heard like different um, ways of expressing these interventions. But at the beginning, they were uh, in the 20s or 30s, they trying to they were trying to talk about this hygienist urbanism uh, with uh, operations making big holes in the city and or uh, projects like the one of the Corbusier and uh, the, the, he made that big plan for the city of Barcelona. Uh, with this uh, terminology of uh, hygienism and uh, healthy cities. And this terminology has been uh, reduced. Uh, then it was like a, a chirurgical uh, surgery in the city, no? like small interventions. And uh, with the time now, they are talking about acupuncture. I don't know the word in English. I think it's uh, acupuncture. No? Mm. Acupuncture. So... The, the the scale of the intervention is 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 going uh, like it's making it smaller, but they think the ideology behind is always this um, kind of uh, cleaning the city, which I have to say that sometimes scares me because sometimes I'm not sure about what we, what we are cleaning, no? Because uh, according to other studies, social studies, uh, it has um, they have shown that many of these uh, uh, super urban plannings. Uh, there is behind the notion of uh, need to clean the city of uh, people that um, what we were talking about now that we don't want in our cities. So sometimes I think we have to be very careful with this uh, language because it can be can hide uh, kind of also including racist uh, yeah. uh, point of view. No? Okay. Yes, I understand. Um, uh, well, you introduced the matter of time, uh, so um, it makes me difficult because I, I would, I want, I actually wanted to ask you uh, if something changed uh, with the with the last with the pandemic uh, on this. But actually, if you claim time to assess all these uh, processes, which is which I very much agree with, so uh, I will skip this question. But uh, it's a um, it's a, an issue that uh, we were talking about. Um, public space used by private enterprises somehow. And we, we only quoted uh, very small examples. Actually, there are other, there could be other examples. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the beginning, uh, Nikos was talking about private spaces used somehow as a surrogate of public spaces during the lockdown, especially. Mm -hmm. And um, so perhaps uh, since we are talking almost one hour now, I would just, I would like to pose this last question to the both of you. Um, uh, the role of architects, what can architects do in this context of tension between private space and public space? How do you see uh, your role? Uh, Nikos, would you like to start? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I think I've been observing um, in uh, different places um, a uh, 
younger generation of architects that I think uh, Marina is part of, uh, more than myself, um, trying to redefine the role of um, architecture and the role of themselves as architects within uh, society. And by doing that, uh, they um, are, let's say, uh, deploying tools that are not traditionally um, architectural tools. They are deploying social uh, tools that uh, make them uh, agents between um, um, communities and their needs and uh, the public space uh, or the authorities. They are deploying um, different um, production methods that uh, make the creation of something more tangible and less dependent on uh, money as a resource. And uh, they are also reinventing the relationships between themselves in terms of uh, how they um, work and collaborate with each other. Um, so I would say that this is where I place my um, hope and my attention to in terms of uh, the future uh, regarding the role of um, uh, architecture. Uh, it's, um, I think, uh, a good sign that the last few um, Biennales of Architecture in Venice have been drawing attention not to star architecture, but to um, aspects of, uh, of um, the intervention of architects in, uh, at a smaller scale, at an acupuncture scale, like Marina uh, pointed out, uh, which uh, involves more uh, participatory methods um, and, uh, as I already said, different economic and production models other than the ones that we are used uh, um, until now. Okay. So, well, actually, uh, a deeper attention to probably social identity. This was a key word that uh, we raised. And uh, somehow uh, an ambition of creating a collective awareness. W would you agree with that? And then the question is, uh, once we have this collective awareness, how can we interact with it in order to transform physically the spaces we live in? Marina, would you like to answer on this? Yeah, yeah. I like particularly these questions because when you talked about the the subject, I I love this this question because, like particularly, I like uh, as an architect, as a user, I like I love these in between spaces that we you you talk about in your question. These uh, terraces, balconies, porch, uh, whatever. Uh, that sometimes I think we don't take uh, care of them, but I, I think in our Mediterranean culture, these spaces have been really important, like culturally. May and, I interrupt you uh, on this? Because we have, a, we have a question from the audience about porches, and the question oh. arrives from London, so it's not only Mediterranean spaces. Okay. The, the issue is broader. <laughs> but okay, go ahead, so, sorry. <laughs> so I think that the, the quality of these spaces is like, they are not uh, defined. They are not destined to uh, concrete uh, um, a, a unique action, like can be the other spaces, spaces of the house, other spaces in the cities. So these in-between spaces that are not private but are not public, sometimes they, get, they give much more opportunities that to, to imagine uh, activities to do and uh, ways of relating to the other than other spaces that are much more... Um, particularly uh, defined for an action, for a determinate action. So um, I think I, I like what happened in this space. And I think in this lockdown, it has been a, a very nice experience to, to see the, pot the potential, the power of this uh, in between spaces. Uh, I don't know, I've been looking like um, gossiping a lot, no? like what happens in in the balconies, in the terrace, uh, also even in the sidewalks, because 
maybe we are used to live in the cities, but if we talk about public space also in, in rural areas, I think in Italy or Greece, uh, it could be a similar situation. The use of the sidewalk in order to, to the use of the sidewalk uh, every night when they, every neighbor put the chair in front of the house and uh, this uh, space um, becomes suddenly uh, in between space, it's not public, it's not private, it's the space for some neighbors who are together talking. I think this, this, uh, these situations create uh, very nice spaces that maybe we are not uh, watching uh, um, with uh, a lot of attention, but I think it's happened really interesting things. And these things are really um, related to what we're, you were saying, is this social identity and this collective awareness. Uh, I think, for example, there is a relation, a direct, uh, direct uh, relation between the use of balconies or the sidewalks or even the terraces, the roof terraces, uh, and the social community, for example, in one street. And this is something that in the 60s, Jane Jacobs started to, to claim. And uh, the relation of, uh, in between the private space and the public space, the, the eyes that were in every window uh, taking care of what was going on in the street, and that could uh, um, supply the people that uh, were um, walking some security, some control, some uh, sensation of not being alone. Uh, and this relation, for example, with the, the, between the house and the street, one of the factors I think that uh, has uh, provoked that uh, a separation between the private and the space, for example, is air conditioning. No, the air conditioning inside the houses has, um, I think, uh, has led the house to be always all the time closed. So the relation between the the people who live inside the house and what's going on in the street. Uh, it's not so direct, uh, but I think with this lockdown we have learned to interact much more between the inside of the house and the and the um, and the street. So I think this can create some uh, links, some community. Also, the use, the common use of the um, of the terraces, of the common terraces in the buildings, has also promoted some uh, links between neighborhoods who maybe they didn't know even their names. And um, I think. I, I, when you asked these questions, I started to to, to imagine all the, what the power of these spaces, and I, I was like, wow, I think architects should uh, really um, make some pressures that, uh, for these spaces, spaces to exist. Because sometimes uh, maybe the pro, um, promoters or clients don't uh, think they are useful, but finally I think very nice things can generate in these spaces, can be generated. Uh, Marina, thanks, because I would take this as a conclusive uh, sentence. <laughs> that's, a, that's a perfect conclusion of our talk here, because we, we need to, to close. Uh, but really, bo to both of you, very, very much thank you for being thank with you. us. It was an interesting talk. Um, next Tuesday, we have uh, another issue, um, slightly different. We, the title is Standard versus Singular, and we talk about digital production and how this can affect all kinds of uh, design questions that we are dealing with related to lockdown, but not only as usual. So thanks for being with us and see you next Tuesday. Bye. Thank you.